Looking at the last moments of Lane's life, they seem to fly by in an instant, years before he even dies alone in his apartment. Lane almost looks like a corpse. One of the last times we see him, it almost looks like he's singing at his funeral, but still with so much passion, so much beauty, such a pure talent that you're just in awe of. We see Lane in his last moments, stuck in a hole he can't climb out of. It's a devastating and tragic heartbreak of a story. This is one of the biggest tragedies in the world of art. When we lost Lane Staley, laying in his rot, until he found death. When we find Lane, it's early into 1996. The public hasn't seen much of him, and he's now come out to perform the Unplugged set with Alice in Chains, setting out on a big tour. It's even obvious in 1996, as the public is looking at Lane, that something's not right. It would be just a short seven years later, we would lose Lane. But in that time, there's many stories and whispers of who and where saw Lane, and what little bit of information Lane was telling people. In the middle of 1996, Alice in Chains will finish up a handful of shows with their playing arenas, opening up for KISS when they're trying to get back in some sort of rhythm with being a band, touring, being together, and enjoying what they're doing. They've been gone from the stage for quite some time, but sadly, it would be the last time they would be on stage with Lane. When Lane walks off the stage for his last show ever, to say Lane became a recluse and extremely private is quite the understatement. Even to this day, people fight and argue about what is true and what is false. But the facts that we do know is that Lane was already struggling with a drug addiction, addicted to heroin and cocaine, and also compounding all of that, struggling from a broken heart with someone that he truly missed and what Lane didn't know at the time that he was never going to have again. His longtime girlfriend and at one point fiance, Demery, they were on again and off again. Demery and Lane truly had a little bit of a Sid and Nancy story of their own the other one cheating on the other one at opposite times, having fights about drugs. One tries to get clean while the other one doesn't. One of them almost overdosing and ending up in the hospital to waking up to the other one by their bedside holding their hand. It's a truly remarkable story that came from their relationship, but in no doubt is a sad story. Two people that could have had a marriage and a family and lived a clean life, but many elements snuck their way in. Demery was said to be a strong-willed person and love art, which is what attracted Lane to her. They first met in 1989, before Lane was even known to the world. Still to this day, many fans and family disagree on one big element. It's who introduced who to heroin when it came to their relationship. Some say that Demery introduced Lane to heroin, but many are confident that Lane was the one like had Demery hooked on heroin. But in the end, the circumstances would win for both their lives. In October of 1996, Demery would overdose and unable to be revived. She would die from her addiction, young and beautiful, gone at 27. With the loss of the person that Lane truly loved, even though they weren't together at that moment, close friends of Lane still knew that he still loved Demery. But now with Demery's death, and the compounding of daily hour-by-hour hour drug use, and Lane's body slowly decaying, rotting from the inside out. The death of Demery was something that his heart could not take. He was simply dying from drugs and a broken heart. In April of 1997, Lane would purchase his condo, located in the University District of Seattle, a downtown area. It would become his tomb at that point. His whole world would be wrapped up in this condo. But Lane's friends, family, and anybody that he knows, if they didn't make an effort to see him, they wouldn't know if he was alive or dead. All contact has been lost with Lane as he lies in his apartment, and the rot of Lane begins. With Lane not leaving his apartment, having food and drugs brought to him, and playing video games during the day and the night when he's not sleeping, in just a short time, Lane becomes unrecognizable. He's losing teeth, 
someday is not able to talk. What was a tall, strapping lead singer has now become skin and bones. In this time, many people try reaching out to Lane with projects, coffee dates, simple get-togethers to check up on Lane, but many of these get-togethers seem to fall through on Lane's part. But during the middle of 1998, Alice and Chains wanted to get back in the studio, writing songs, getting back on the road. The band decided to release a box set, adding a few new songs to it. And in this, we see Lane come out of his condo, singing, writing. But when Lane makes his appearance to the studio on his birthday, it's the first time many people have even seen Lane and shocked and saddened by how their friend looks. He's unrecognizable from what he was. The band starts to work on their new songs together, but tensions start to run high. Lane's rusty, his voice is cracked, he's missing teeth, he disappears to the bathroom, he falls asleep in corners. It's said that Lane and Jerry Cantrell start to have passive aggressive conversations. Lane's not able to focus, obviously, showing up to the studio with a huge drug addiction. It's safe to say, looking at the situation, that Jerry's just frustrated. Something that he's built up so hard with his friends, Alice in Chains, with an amazing lead singer who's one of his dearest friends, he knows is in terrible health and just wants him to be happy and healthy and not seeing his friend do what he knows he can do. There's no doubt it was devastating for Jerry, but also extremely frustrating. Needless to say, with Lane showing up to the studio with problems, and on the first day, even showing up late, and already having an excuse that he can't stay long, that he's got to get back to the airport and catch a flight back home to be at his sister's wedding, even though he knows the whole band only has so much time to record with the studio and producer they have with them. And what would later be found out, that Lane's sister had no such wedding planned. Lane wraps up his vocals as much as he can into the long night. Tensions running high, regretful things said back and forth. The band will end up getting a few new songs done for Alice in Chains' box set. Lane finishes the rest of his vocals in Seattle, but the whole recording process did not go well for Lane. Making him frustrated and more than likely embarrassed about his health, and knowing that people are talking about him. Having trouble with his vocals, small little arguments about lyrics, and tension surrounded with paranoia, with the band, producers, people helping. It's obvious to everyone this is not going well and just trying to produce some kind of product out of the session. With Lane soon disappearing back into Seattle in his condo, it's really just him and his cat, some friends checking in on him, but mostly, his mother and father making random phone calls or checkups on him. Lane's mother and father know that his health is declining, but are just not able to get Lane where he needs to be to get treatment. Later, a music video will be released, along with the new box set of Alice in Chains, with a few new songs, but the footage of Lane and the new music video is just old and from the past. Lane has no intention of promoting the song, and just simply has lost interest in the project. Lane's last recording session as a singer is in 1998, covering Not Another Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd, with other famous musicians having their part. Many critics tear the song apart and say that Lane's voice is flat and lazy and is named one of the most depressing songs of that year. Somehow, miraculously, there's no photos or video of Lane with this project just his vocals. The last public appearance and photos ever taken of Lane are in October of 1998. We see Lane clean himself up a little bit because he's asked by a friend to come and see his band perform. That friend would be Jerry Cantrell. We see Lane dressed up, having fun. Jerry even asking Lane to come on stage and sing with him, but Lane declines and says he can't. A few pictures have surfaced of that one night showing Lane what it looks to be a fun night for him. There is believed to be pictures of Lane right around Valentine's Day, weeks before his death, while visiting family. These photos have never been made public, but from that point on, this would be it for Lane. As he was back home, losing more and more contact with everyone, 
There would be sightings of him. Mostly people saw Lane at his local Toys R Us buying video games, then sneak back into his condo. But at that rate, Lane did not even look like Lane and was unrecognizable to most. Lane had not talked to the public since his last interview in 1997. Although in January of 2002, an interview would randomly surface a few years later with a journalist who said she had an interview with Lane just three months before his death. The interview was almost too juicy and would go into great detail of Lane's situation, of Lane saying things that didn't seem to fit Lane and saying that he was going to die soon. This interview is highly thought to be fabricated and have never even taken place. And people that knew Lane knew that he did not like journalists and never wanted to talk to them. And there's no way he would have been this personal with a random stranger. Lane's sister would go so far to make a public statement about this interview, saying that she and her family dug into the background of the story, proving that the person that gave it had no proof that they really did talk to Lane, but needed the story because they had a book about Lane coming out and also trying to make a movie of Lane's life. So many believe to this day that the interview is 100% fake, but sadly, there is no last goodbye from Lane. Through Lane's life, he's had multiple stints trying to get clean with friends and family and even his bandmates trying to help him. But in the end, Lane cannot beat his addiction. Lane's mother says she was never far away from her son, checking in on him, sometimes multiple times a week, phone calls daily, sometimes getting an answer and sometimes not, trying to break down the wall that Lane had put up. She knew Lane was in bad shape, saying the last time she saw him, she could tell something was wrong, more than usual. On April 19th, Lane's mother Nancy received a phone call saying that Lane's bank account had not been touched in two weeks, which was unusual and she had not heard from Lane for two weeks, which she said was usual. But with a mother's instinct, she called the authorities saying that she needed to check in on her son that he had not been seen or heard from. Nancy and her ex-husband, Lane's father, meet the police at Lane's home. When police make their way into Lane's condo, they immediately find Lane slumped over on the couch, deceased and had been there for quite some time, and Lane's cat that was pawing for food. Some have even said that Lane still had a needle in his other hand, loaded and waiting to be shot up. Lane's mother asked and begged to please come in and see her son, where the person in charge told Lane's mother, you don't want to see what's in there, but I'm not going to deny a mother from seeing her son. As Susan walks in the apartment, she's met with odor and just an unclean sight. She sees Lane on the couch. She goes and sits next to him and starts talking to him. It's Nancy's son, her baby boy, not the rock star, not the icon in people's eyes. It's Susan's son. She taught how to walk and hold her hand while he giggled and had no fear in the world while he was just a young child with his mother. Now her son is gone in a terrible way. As Susan sat next to Lane's body that was there for two weeks and now only weighing 86 pounds, laying alone in the condo from sun up to sun down, covered in drug paraphernalia. Susan said she recalled saying to Lane when she saw him laying there and gone, I told him I was sorry, but this is how it turned out. Nancy herself was also at war with Lane's addiction trying and fighting as hard as she could in the best way she knew possible, fighting for her child. Lane's addiction was not just something he picked up a few years back. It was something that he was dealing with and picked up on very early in to Alice in Chains, and the majority of his life being addicted to any and all drugs and in and out of rehab. As authorities search the apartment, it's considered condemned with the carpets being riddled with stains, body fluids. Police also find Lane's car outside in the parking lot where he kept it. It had been broken into with a few minor things taken. Years later, and not too many years back from now, Mike Starr, the bass player of Alice in Chains, would come face to face with Lane's mother Susan, telling her that he was with Lane 
hours before he died, shooting up with him, and that him and Lane had an argument where Mike became upset, storming out of the condo, with Lane yelling, don't leave like this, not like this. But sadly, Mike Starr would also lose his life to addiction in 2001. There's a weird coincidence that Lane has in his life while he's alive and he finds in death. As Lane is from Seattle himself, he has a neighbor that he's always around that seems to find himself quite popular too. But miraculously, the two artists do not have one picture together that's ever surfaced. Lane's neighbor was Kurt Cobain. There's a story that surfaced with Lane in one of his last interviews that he said he ran into Cobain while in Seattle. Kurt was in need of a ride home. Lane and Kurt know each other and are casual friends. And for a brief moment in time, they spent a little moment together with Lane, giving Kurt a ride home. Lane says that when Kurt was in his car, he seemed happy talking about his daughter, but this was just weeks before Cobain would harm himself. The news of Kurt Cobain's death devastated Lane, shocked him, and even made Lane go clean for quite some time. He knew about Kurt's addiction problems, and he knew they had very similar stories, almost identical in many ways. Lane's condo is only miles away from Cobain's home where he took his life, and somehow in the fabric of time and space, Lane would die the exact same day as Cobain on April 5th, eight years prior. Two different people with many of the same sufferings and outcomes. Lane's story is one of sadness, riddled with addictions, and an outcome we wish we could have helped. But there's no doubt, Lane has made his spot on the canvas of art. He'll never be forgotten. He's made his place and as long as humans are around, they'll always remember the tall, lanky singer from a band called Alice in Chains who had a big voice and a big heart that people still adore to this day. Long live the memory of Lane.